I'm Gary Carter, and um, I'm going to be, along with Anne, running the um, experiential anatomy course. And I've been brought in, um, so it's new to me to run this course. I run various courses over the last 30 years, but um, this is exciting for me to be involved in this. And it's the first time really, I think for, um, <clears throat> Anne, I know, I think it's first time for you, isn't it, that uh, this has gone online. Um, so I, I'm teaching a lot online at the moment. Of course, Zoom has forced that for a lot of people. Um, so it's an exciting venture. The first time from Anne, how Anne and Esther had spoken to me earlier, but this is the first time that it's we've ever done an introduction for this sort of course. Usually people would see the information on the course on book onto something like that. And what we'd like to do is just give you a really more of a flavor as to what could be occurring in, within the course, giving you just a bit of basic information from it really um, in a presentation style as to how the course could unfold. And also, I think hopefully that will give you a bit of an idea as to the way that I'm thinking um, in how I'm putting this together and also definitely how Anne's working with, and Anne's been teaching on this course for a lot longer than I have. This is new to me in teaching this particular course. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to, to Anne Stevens um, and Anne will go through some stuff with you and then she'll pass back to me at some point and then I'll continue on from there. We'll have a break um, about halfway through, just for about five minutes, just as a, a screen break and water in, water out time. Um, and then we'll get to the end. We'll finish our time, UK time, about quarter past, so 15 minutes earlier, so that um, we can answer any questions. Now, what I, as much as we'd love to hear everyone talking to us about questions, I, I don't think that would work. So um, I think the best thing for us to do is to, if you've got some questions, you can type them in. And at that point, Esther will come in. She'll look at the questions and we, we can probably pick about maybe two or three to answer for you. Um, this is being recorded, as you can see. Um, so I don't know if any names or images might come up on the screen, but if you're okay with it being recorded, this recording, of course, will go to you. Um, the one thing that I do suggest, though, is that with any of the images that are used in the slideshow that, that I'll be running is to keep that for personal use. These aren't to go out to um, social media, um, if that's okay with everyone. So we just, we trust everyone on that. And that's pretty much how things will happen as the course runs too. So from there, um, I'd like to pass you on to Anne Stevens. So Anne, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um... Yes, it is a first to do an introduction evening at all. Um, and we did part of the course last year online, which was also a first for me. We managed to get a few sessions in. Then um, I think we did five seminars online and we managed to just get the last one in and meet up again. And then it was back to lockdown again. So this time it's safer to do the whole thing online because it as we all know, <clears throat> times and dates and lockdowns come and go. So um, it'll be slightly different, but for me, very much the same in terms of uh, what I'm teaching. Um, but sort of short introduction, I'm a physiotherapist um, and I qualified in Denmark about 25 years ago. Worked briefly in Denmark for a year and then I came over here and then I was in the NHS for three years, hospital, private hospital for four years. And then I've been a private practice in Bushy near Watford for the last 16 years. Um, and I'm a very, I'm a hands-on physio. I've decided to stay with the physio rather than going into managers roles and stuff like that. I really like to work hands-on. Um, and I like to help people. That was sort of my main reason for becoming a physio in the first place. I <clears throat> have always gone for the soft, gentle approach. And then I started, I heard about cranial. I went and I qualified in 2004. I've assisted a, on a couple of the um, practitioner training courses. And in 2010, I started teaching the anatomy course as it's known today. Um, and I've always been teaching the same courses, which is nice because you sort of develop and add things to it and learn more every time. Um, the first seminar I'll be doing is the 
uh, heart and lungs, the breath and blood, um, which is very much the anatomy of the organs and how, what they do. Um, and the lungs, of course, supply us with oxygen and jumping into the blood takes it around to the whole body. We're gonna have the whole uh, cardiovascular system of how blood circulates. Um, is very much anatomy, but it's also feeling it and, and sensing it and understanding it and taking pulses and sort of practical in a sense. Um, the other, the next course I'll be coming in on is the, the gut and how we metabolize. So the whole digestive tract from your bottom to your anus basically, and all the organs that attach to the digestive tract, what they do, where they sit, we're gonna feel them on the body so you can get a sense of how they are lying inside the body. Um, and how we, metabolize how the food we eat gets broken down into smaller particles and how that then gets transformed into energy in different parts of the body. Um, the last thing I'll be doing is I'll teach one day on the last seminar, which is then the kidneys and the um, bladder and reproductive organs, which is called together the urogenital system. So the lower part of the pelvis, what lies down there. In another way, it's how we eliminate things. So the kidneys filter everything and then they eliminate what we don't need via the bladder. Um, and the reproductive system I'm covering because it's there and it's in the same region and they have communal nerves and um, other parts that connects everything together. And the way I see it is that the, the, what we learn about in the first seminar is the oxygen that we breathe in. And the second seminar is the food that we ingest. And the two combined is what gets transformed into energy that our body uses to move us, to repair whatever we are breaking down every day just by living and moving and to reproduce new cells, new life, uh, repair anything in the body that needs renewing, new blood cells. So <clears throat> cell reproduction that happens all the time so we can stay alive. And then the elimination, as I said, of the waste and the control. It's all one circular movement and it's all about homeostasis and getting everything to be in balance. Uh, when I teach, there's always some embryology in there that explains how it all starts from the embryo up to a human, full human being. Um, I like my anatomy. <laughs> uh, so there will always be anatomy in depth uh, and physiology as in how does it all work? How, how does this go from here to there? what drives something across a membrane, what pulls it back out again. So sometimes we go really down into smaller details and then I like to zoom back out again so we can understand how that connects to the whole picture. Um, I'm very visual, so I like good images. I like to understand and turn things this way and that way and really get a good visual image of it because then I can feel it or sense it or imagine it in my own body and that's what we're trying to get you to do as well to embody the learning that you are getting from us. Um, I use videos sometimes a little video can in 30 seconds explain half an hour of me waffling um, or it can connect like a whole day into one little five minutes. Now you can understand all the words and all the processes and it makes a lot more sense when you see it as a brief video towards the end. I also use mind maps 
to get an overview in another visual way. And I put them at the beginning. And as we go along, I put more words on. So in the end, at the end of a seminar, you will have the whole mind map. Um, and yeah, normally I jump up and down a lot and make people stand up and do things. And we're sort of busy and arms moving and all of that. So I try to not be too boring. But uh, because it's online now, a lot of it will be me talking at you. <laughs> so I'm more conscious of then breaking it up with um, exercises, sensing, feeling, monitoring, measuring. Um, so you get some self-experiential movements, some meditations, use the anatomy to then go inside and imagine your body and feel it inside. And group work as well because you can only take so much screen time and being talked at I know that so I like to break up in break you up into little groups of three four people so that you sit and talk to each other and you have to get a pen and paper out and you have to look on your phone and all your books or online and find information so there's a conversation between you going on as well and um Normally we'll see how we can do it online, but it should be possible for you to then come back and present to the rest of the group what you found out. So I'll ask you a question that I haven't already told you and then the information about, and you find out something about this subject, and then you come back and pre present it to the rest of us. So between all the different ways of teaching and self-experience and group work, we shall keep you occupied and interested, hopefully for the two full days for the weekends. Um, I'll <clears throat> just do a little taster to do now before I hand over to Gary. Um, because I teach the breath and blood and this one exercise that I'm teaching you now is probably one of the ones I show the most to patients that is both a cranial in my world, but also a physio um, exercise. And today I've shown it to definitely two people and reminded somebody that I taught it to last week of to continue to remember how to do it. And it's literally how to breathe. <laughs> and it's very, very simple, but yet most people don't use all the muscles available to breathe. We all know about the diaphragm that goes from side to side and front to back, like a diaphragm, the whole way across the body. It sits up here normally and when we breathe in, it drags down and it sucks the air into the lungs. It creates an under pressure that makes us breathe in. Most people are also aware of the muscles up here that when we breathe very shallowly, it's mostly up here, a little bit of the diaphragm and people that are really struggling with asthma and COPD, <clears throat> they all often breathe with these muscles. But between all the ribs that we have, we have what's called intercostal muscles that sit between the ribs in different directions. And they, <clears throat> if you imagine your ribs, they go from the front from your sternum all the way around you to the back and into the spine. And they literally sit on either side and as you breathe in, they should lift up like bucket handles. And as they breathe out, they should go back down again. And that expands your breath, your rib cage, like a balloon in all directions. And that adds extra air into the lungs and also helps in many other ways. So what I'd like you to do now is to sit in a position where you can put your hands on your ribs like this. So you need space behind you for your elbows. So come forward on the seat if you're in the sofa and have your hands just underneath your boobs if you have any. Um, and just relax the hands sort of just gently onto the rib cage. And you can usually feel if you push in just a little bit, you can feel the ribs underneath your hands. And if you can imagine that bucket handle starting here at the front, and finishing on the back. And what I'd like you to do now is to take a deep breath in and just feel what happens with your hands. 
do they get moved out and do they sink back in again when you breathe in? For a lot of people, they don't. They just, they move a tiny little bit. And you can feel your stomach moving, your stomach pushes out and goes back in again. And that's fine, it should be doing that. But with your hands on the side of your ribs, what I'd like you to do, if they're not moving in, or even if they are, just to make them work a little bit more. If you take a breath out, and very gently with your hands push in as if you want to push a little bit more breath out. And then when you breathe in, let go of your hands and push your hands sideways with your ribs. And literally lift sideways with your rib cage. And then as you breathe out again, just add a little bit of pressure with your hands so you can feel the ribs go down. And then breathe in again very slowly out. And imagine that balloon that expands sideways, front to back, up, down, everywhere. The whole rib cage expands like a balloon. And then as you breathe out, it very slowly deflates and go back out again. It's not always easy to do to begin with, especially when you're sitting, trying and listening to me at the same time. But if you find that those ribs are just moving, maybe that much. They should be able to move with at least a fingers or so between the ribs, really lift up and then just gently float back down again. When you do it, when you sit on your own, if you close your eyes, it's easier. Knowing the anatomy helps. So we'll be doing this again in the seminar, but it's just one of the exercises that I give where you physically can feel with your hands the changes, the movements in your body, and you can relate to the anatomy that you've just been told um, and seen images of. And breathing that way helps because the ribs attach into the spine by each vertebrae. So what should be happening is every time you breathe in and that bucket handle swings up and it swings down, there's a little pump there that helps to get the fluid in and out of all these joints along the spine. So both your blood, your cerebrospinal fluid and the lymph all gets pumped just a little bit every time you breathe. If you don't breathe with your ribs, if they're sitting in there and they're really tight, you've lost a lot of extra movement in and around the spine and help with the flow around the whole lung and the heart system. So, that's as much as I will say now. I think that was just a brief introduction, a little exercise, and then I'll, I'll hand down to Gary again. Back to Gary. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> so what I'll take, over, I'll take over from that in, in a second, but I'll, I'll introduce myself as well. <clears throat> so um, I come from quite a varied background of uh, different disciplines of sport and movement. Um, when I was quite young, I was um, involved in um, top level cycling and I was going to become a professional cyclist. Um, but unfortunately, a car put an end to that. Um, my head, my bike and a car stopped me from going down the professional route. However, we had a really interesting coach that um, started teaching us about the elasticity of the spinal movement. And that became a big interest to me. So whenever we were doing what's known as stretching, um, he never called it stretching, he called it elasticity training. And that just became the thing that I understood in terms of what people did with stretching, I called it elasticity training, because we would always move the body to a particular point where it reached an edge, and then we allowed it to return once again, rather than just trying to stretch really hard, which is what we see a lot of people do. And that was just normal for me to, to become that way inclined in this elastic way of moving. Um, so I didn't ride bikes for a long time after that. And my father got me lifting weights to try and keep some sort of fitness going. And I couldn't really run around for a while because the injury was quite bad. So I did all of my training on the spot. But it was something that really became an interest of mine. Um, Alongside that, in my professional life at that time, I then started to become a graphic designer and I was involved in 3D graphics. And it's before these devices, before computers, that makes me sound old. 
Um, we, we were model making, making things by hand. So I, I could very quickly start to see in 3D and had a very good understanding of seeing models in 3D and designing these things in 3D. So when it came to my life of training and weight training, that, that really captured my imagination. And I actually went down a route of bodybuilding. Um, it doesn't look like it now, but I was involved in natural bodybuilding. And the interesting thing with that is that I had some very good coaches and trainers that would really teach us about the feel of the body and movement when we were training. And it was quite interesting to me because I, I then started to get interested in the anatomy as a self-study. And very quickly, I could start to put that together as a 3D model in my head. Um, the thing that was very interesting when I was working alongside bodybuilders that were going into top level competition, the condition that they get their body into, as some of you might have seen in magazines, it's not the thing that people like that much to see, um, but the movement of, say, someone training their bicep, for instance, could be seen in the actual calf. So the back of the lower leg, we could see responding to the movement of the arm. And I really found that fascinating and started to very quickly realize that you cannot train the body in isolation. Anyway, cut, cut a, a very long story, quite short. Um, I then trained to become a, um, a fitness trainer, physical trainer. And alongside that route, I started to set up a gym. I ended up leaving the world of graphics and um, became a trainer. But along with that, I had a keen interest of doing manual therapy. So what I then started was shiatsu. Um, traditional Chinese medicine and meridian theories had always been an interest of mine because within all of my years of training, I also studied some martial arts and that is, continues to be a practice of mine. And shiatsu seemed to make sense in the way that we were handling the body. Um, there was always a lot of anatomy that was, that was understood within those particular trainings and teaching of, of shiatsu, but also coming from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective, it was a very different look on the body from a different perspective and looking at continuity. So where we see meridians traveling through the body that would then relate to muscular structures. Through that time, I, I became quite interested in fascia and cranial sacral work came up. Um, again, it's a long story as to how that got there, but that appeared in my life. And I found that when I was working on someone's body with shiatsu, I was picking up something under my hands that my shiatsu teachers couldn't describe back to me. And of course, when I started to study in cranial work, I started to realize that I wasn't touching the energetics of meridians. I was actually meeting a different rhythm. And I thought, well, what is this rhythm and where is it coming from? So of course, as I traveled further down the cranial route, the, the idea of fascia really started to make sense to me. Um, and that led me then to contact a man called Tom Myers, who's written a book that most people probably know of called The Anatomy Trains. Um, and I met Tom in the late 90s and started to work alongside him, where I'd already been teaching levels of anatomy for particular movement schools in the UK and looking at how we connect structures up in the body. And then when I met Tom Myers, he, he put all the missing pieces into the link. And there wasn't a book called Anatomy Trains at that particular time. It was more of a notion or an idea. And I ended up studying in structure integration. So some of you may have heard of Rolfing. <clears throat> Tom was trained in the Rolfing method. But what he did is he split from the Rolf school and created his own methodology of, of structure integration, which is the school that I trained through. Then I used to um, teach alongside Tom Myers in the very early days of, of anatomy trains. But because I come from a movement background, I was really interested in the dynamics of how these tissues started to respond in movement and then use my hands in, in manual therapy to assist in that. Um, where Tom doesn't come from a movement background, he's a a pure kind of structure integration practitioner. So we, eventually we went our separate ways and I created my own schools of movement and fascial training. Um, alongside that, I've become, I do a lot of dissection work. I've been um, doing dissections since about 2003, 2004 and studied at the Institute of Anatomy in Vienna. 
And that made a lot of sense to me um, in understanding what's underneath the skin. And we see anatomy books, you know, Anne knows when, when we see anatomy books, a lot of you might've looked at anatomy books that really the anatomy book is half the picture. It's a very cleaned up vision of the body. And it's necessary for us to make sense of it. But of course in dissection, once we get under the skin, it looks nothing like an anatomy book. It takes a lot of cleaning up with scalpels to actually get the body that you see in dissection to actually look like the anatomy book. So I've done spent a lot of years working in, in sort of anatomical dissection and then moving it into what's known as fascial based dissection. And along with that, that's led me to work with an organization called the Fascial Net Plastination Project where I work alongside um, a man called Gunther von Hagen, some of you might have heard of, who does the Body Worlds exhibits where you've got the placinated anatomical bodies, um, exhibitions around the world. And um, I've now, I am lead this um, dissector and designer of the world's first ever fascial plastinated body. And at the moment she's in the plastinating process to be positioned and it's taken us two years to dissect her. And that's a really interesting process to go through because usually in dissection, we can go through dissection, taking a body from skin right the way down to bone in about 10 days. We've been working with this body for two years and we're not reducing it down to bone. We're actually working on detail to show the world how fascial structures are laid out within the system. And even though we're doing that, we're trying to show continu continuity and connectivity. Um, we're having to anatomize the body to do so. And some of you might have understood the word, but the word anatomy means to cut up. And what we're looking at doing is trying to find a way to put it all back together again. So even though this course has the word anatomy in it, which is a, a necessity, Really what we're doing here between Anne and myself is trying to find a way to weave all of that information back together and make it one whole body that moves again. And that's, that's a lot of the work that I try to do in, in experiential anatomy. So what will come up through some of the imagery on the slideshows will be some of the images that we have from part of our project. We can't show all of that because some of it sort of sits in the top secret realm at the moment until the body is finally unveiled at what's known as the World Fascia Congress in Montreal in 2022. Um, but we'll be able to show you some snippets, but also helping you to see things differently because I've, again, I come from a, a 3D background and of course I can't be with you in a room, but we've, we've got ways that, you know, I can show you something on a screen and we've got different ways that we can start to explore looking at models we can find the best possible way to do that and as Anne um, had said also using um, video as well is, is really quite useful in getting you to touch and move your own bodies which is something that we're going to look at. So what I'd like to do um, here is is just run through a series of, series of slides and I'm going to be putting a few things together that are probably, I would say, snippets or bits of information from what would be happening in some elements of what I would be teaching through the course. Again, as you probably gathered, I, I look at and research a lot of fascia. I'm part of the Fascia Research Society. So my, my job really is to tether all of these dynamics together through the fascial medium but every now and again, as we're making that journey through the fascial medium, we stop in a landmark in the body and look at the associated anatomy. And then we move on through the fascia from there to where the next possible stop off would be. And then look at that anatomy again. And as Anne said, we zero in, we look at it in detail, and then we zoom back out to see how it connects and makes sense of the whole. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. You can do the thumbs up. No one's got pictures of thumbs though. We've seen a few thumbs coming up. That's great. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to go to screen share and I'll pick up from where Anne was talking um, in terms of breath. So what I'm going to do here is go to the screen share now and I can see a few of you by the side of the screen. And I can see you, I can see M. So can you see my background of slides here? It's usually a big bank of slides. Um, I often use far too many slides on my slideshows, but um, 
I think it's always good to have some extras. <clears throat> so Anne was talking about this particular region and I, I find it a fascinating region and the word ribcage gets used a lot. And it's an interesting word to use to, to, to reference this particular region that we would consider the breath to move in and out from. Um, but when you look at the nature of the intercostal muscles of which Anne was gesturing with her fingers where we've got these directions of muscle layers that exist between the ribs, what we have when we look at them, you've got the internal, external intercostals. And what we also find when we dissect um, and we dissect into these regions is another intermediary layer that is existent in some bodies and not in others, which is really quite interesting is a muscular direction that just goes straight up and down between the ribs, whereas the internal external intercostals run at angles. So you have, in some cases, a, a three-ply layout of tissues. And where we find um, in some forms the muscle tissue not going from top to bottom, we do find that there's a, a, a lining of connective tissue, a layer of fascia that exists there following that direction. So these are variances that the bodies have. Um, but another consideration with this region that we call um, the rib cage is, and I know this in Germany, they, they don't use the word cage, is that they use the word basket, rib basket. And I, I kind of like that notion. Also in Austria, when I've taught in Austria, they say, yes, we, we don't use the word. We don't use the word cage we use the word basket when they're in Austria. And I, I think basket makes a lot more sense. And when you look at this structure and you just allow your eyes to relax on the image and you look at the shape of it, it looks like one of those baskets that, or washing basket you put clothes in, but it's upside down. So you've got this basket wave that exists between the ribs. And what it suggests is that the rib structure is extremely flexible and quite mobile. When people rotate, you don't just rotate the ribs as a, a one big unit. The rib structure has the ability to twist on itself just a little. It builds up from the lower part of the spine through to the very upper regions of the spine. And also, when you look at the very top of this image, um, I'm going to use my cursor to point a few things out. But something that I've noticed by using cursors on PowerPoint on Zoom is that sometimes it can freeze the Zoom and I'll have to go off share and come back into it again. So be prepared if that happens to me. Um, but here you can see me moving my cursor and can you see that circling? So this area at the top here, these muscles are known as the scalenes and they're continuous to the fascia of the ribs. So even though we would see in regional anatomy, the scalenes running from the lateral aspects of the cervical spine down to ribs one and two, their fascia is continuous into the fascial lining over the ribs. So something that we could consider is that the rib structure is hanging from your neck. Now, don't take that that literally because it's also then connected to the spine too, otherwise you wouldn't be able to stand up if it was just actually hanging from the neck. But um, from when Anne was showing you the movements of the ribs with her hands, is that some individuals who see in standing positions will almost behave through their neck as if their ribs are literally hanging from their neck. And it's very difficult for them to stand up. And I know Anne and myself, definitely we see this in clinical practice is that posturally, we can see the weight of the ribs drawing down on that individual's neck. There's also other structures that are doing that. So once we can start to find some elongation through the spine, then the rib structure can situate itself well. And what we don't want the ribs to be is something that's postural. We don't want that kind of heavy load running through the ribs. The ribs need to be light and free to allow the breath to move easily into the body. And the structure running up through the center, spine, commonly known as spinal column. So when we consider language, if we have a column and a cage, how does that person believe their body to be? Something that's fixed in the middle, when really, I would say this is probably one of the most jointed regions of the body. It's got a lot of potential for motion. 
So here, yep, so it will, it's had frozen as I figured it might do. So just give me a moment and um, I've just got to go off share, come back to you. The, the wonders of Zoom. And then I'm going to come back to you, come back to the share. And here we go. So I'll go back to this. <clears throat> so when we look at this region here, <clears throat> I'm not going to use my cursor right now, just in case it freezes it. In the center is the structure that Anne was talking about, which is the diaphragm. And here you can see in the image, the diaphragm is up in a dome shape. In any dissection, any illustration that you ever see of the diaphragm, you never see it on the in-breath. We only see it where it's been on the exhale because the individual has finished their life on exhale. They don't finish their life on the in-breath. So we see that nature. And I would say this is probably at the extremes of an exhalation where you've pushed everything out, where usually at the end of an exhalation, it's unlikely to go up this far. But if you look at the curve of the spine, especially through the region of the ribs, that's known as the thoracic curve. That curve is bowing backwards. And then of course you see the curve of the breastbone and that curve in the breastbone has got more of a forward shaped curve to it. So there's this tensional balance between front and back. So as Anne was saying, is that we've got this widening that starts to occur through the rib structure when the breath comes in. But what we also have is a movement from front to back. The breastbone and the thoracic spine have a potential to move away from each other. Rather than the spine just being treated as a column, it's also got some functionality there. It's got motion to it. It's not a fixed curve. And what we do see often in, in various settings is that the spine through the rib area moves more into what's known as a kyphosis. So there's a stronger curve that happens in that region. And then we see lack of motion there, which can limit the movement for the body and breathing. So here, if we look at where the ribs meet the spine. And again, as I was suggesting, how the ribs meet the spine, what we notice between ribs two to nine, so from your second rib right the way down to your ninth rib, they interface with the disc and two vertebrae. So one rib meets the disc and it meets the two vertebrae, one above. So if you see the, the tiny image at the bottom right hand corner, you can see where the ribs coming to the side of the spine and it's, it's got contact with the disc and there's a ligament that exists in there and it's the intra-articular -art ligament. So it's a ligament that runs from the rib to the disc. And then you have a wrapping of strong connective tissue around it, making a joint capsule. And in that space, you've got synovial fluid. And as Anne was suggesting, when the ribs are moving on the breath, there's fluid flow of all sorts of different regions. But along with that, you've got movement at the disc when you're breathing. As the ribs move on the in-breath, there's a slight lift in the ribs. Again, Anne was suggesting with her hands, this bucket handle action as the ribs lift. What would that be doing to the disc? And when we exhale, the ribs drop a little bit. What would that be doing to the disc? So we see that there's potential for lots of health through this region of the spine, which is an area that can become quite fixed. And you can see just by the illustration on the left, is that there's a lot of connective tissue that makes up this particular region. And here are um, two images from uh, an arm that had been broken, not on purpose. It was like someone had had an accident where their forearm had been broken. And it just so happened that there's a study going on in that particular surgery at that time. And they were looking at the density of connective tissue in the local region of the break, and they're doing a study as to what happens to the connective tissue afterwards. So the image on the left-hand side of your screen is where a camera had gone into the tissues between the muscles of the forearm. I don't know if you can see me on the side of your screen, but this camera had gone into the area between the muscles of the forearm, and they'd, they'd looked at the layout of the connective tissue in that region, got a photograph of it there, and the image on your right-hand side is where the plaster cast had come off the arm, and this is six to eight weeks later in the same region. 
And what we see is that the connective tissue stroke, another word that we use is fascia, the fascial tissue has done something called densified. So it becomes thicker. The reason it does this is because there's lack of motion. And where there's lack of motion, we start to see muscle tissue become a little more reduced. So it's known as atrophy. And what the body does is it lays more collagen down to stabilize the region. But also it lays more collagen down where it starts to notice that there's no more movement. Why would we have an active area when you're not going to move it? So the body will try to set it. Now, of course, with movement, physiotherapy and so on, gradually the connective tissue will remodel itself probably back to something that we would see on the left-hand side. So if stasis is causing a restriction to the connective tissue, what's going to happen in this region of the spine, which is the region through the thoracic spine, when we don't move it? So here on the left-hand side, you see a region of the spine where the ribs meet the spine, and this is a view of the back of the spine. So again, you look at the amount of connective tissue that is there, making up joint capsules, connecting one bone to the next to make sure there's stability, but also to promote motion. And with these multiple joint structures, you've got an incredible amount of connective tissue that's laid down there. So the image on the right, of course, is from a, a dissection that's been cleaned up incredibly. But if you imagine that lack of motion happens through this region and all you need to do, and unfortunately we're living in an era where people are spending a lot more time in front of their computers, the Zoom era. If you lean forwards into your screen a bit more and that becomes your posture, the force, the effort, the load that gets put through these tissues along the back of the spine gives a signal to it to start to brace against the load. And what we do start seeing with some individuals is reduced motion because the connective tissue has to fix the structure in place. And again, as people start to move on, and I'm seeing a few people beginning to sit up right now as I'm saying that, you know, the head weighs a lot, it's a heavy load. And ideally what the spine wants to do is to meet the, the skull underneath, dead center, not at the back of the skull, which is where we see a lot of people, they wear their spine that way. <clears throat> so the front of the spine, again, I love these really old illustrations. As Anne said, you know, she loves anatomy. I love anatomy. I also love the illustrations that come with it. I think some of the older illustrations tell us a lot more about the anatomy than the modern illustrations that we see now in some of the books, because the, some of the modern illustrations almost look like a cartoon. But what you see here is someone's put their love into this. You know, there's passion in it and you can see movement in it. And this is the strong ligament that exists along the front of the spine. It's called the anterior longitudinal ligament. The diaphragm is connected to this. It blends into it. And then again, you look to either side of that channel of the spine is where the ribs are connecting to it again. And again, and, and as I showed you here, we'd mentioned how the ribs connect to the spine, they connect deep to the spine. So if you were to follow the ribs of someone, and we would see if you could do this when we're on the course, you'll be handling your own ribs or maybe a loved one in the house, you could grab them and pull them into the room and bring your hands around their ribs. Because what you'd find <clears throat> is that the ribs, and what I'm gonna do is come off the chair just for the moment. So give me a second, because I'm just going to show you something. What we find is the ribs. Here's three vertebra from the thoracic region of the spine. So this is somewhere in the mid region of my thorax. And what I'm going to show you here <clears throat> is some joint surfaces. So we look at the side of the vertebra I'm going to, with my pen here, I never do this to anybody else's plastic models, I only do it to my own because I can. <clears throat> As you can see where those red spots are, those red spots are synovial joint surfaces, like the joint surface of the knee joint or the hip joint. So they're very slippery surfaces. And 
I have a rib here. And again, you can see corresponding red spots. So they're not red in reality, but these are cartilaginous joint surfaces. And what this rib does is it connects very close to the side of the spine. And you can see how it's connecting to one vertebra, another vertebra and the disc. But if I turn this round, so you're looking at the back of the vertebra, can you see just how deep that rib goes? It goes behind it. So we can't touch that point as a manual therapist because if I show you from the side, you see just how deep to the side of the spine that rib is. Does that make sense to everybody? I can see most of you on the screen now. Yeah, it's a shame you haven't got the drawn thumb once again. Yeah. So again, when we're breathing, this is on the move. And in fact, as much as it has this action of lifting and dropping, because you've got joints that are always slightly rounded, the rib structure actually rolls a little bit. Now this is much more movement than it actually has, but there's a tiny rolling action that happens in those ribs. And in fact, when I'm walking, running, twisting, moving in different directions, what those ribs will be doing, it's a bit like handlebars in a way, is that they would just gently be rolling with the movement of the spine. This is constant undulation that's happening in the system, along with the breath. So something I'd like to explore with you, and we'll do something together if you've got the room to do it, because it, it will require, well, we can do it two ways. You can either come onto all fours, so on your hands and on your knees, or we can do this standing where you've got your hands on a surface or on a chair. Um, I've got a chair just hidden behind the screen out here somewhere, um, but I'll, I'll do this on all four for the moment. I'll show you first and then I'll talk you through it. Because of this connection of how the ribs meet the spine at this particular level, is it means that your spine is part of your breathing mechanism. So it's not that it's just your ribs, it's not that it's just your lungs, it's not that it's just your diaphragm, it's not that it's just these deep muscles within the throat, the spine is also involved in the motion of breath. And can we consider it to be that way? So <clears throat> I'll go through this first. I'll show you both ways and we'll see how this goes, okay? <clears throat> so first thing, can you still hear me when I'm over here? Yeah. Something I've found actually by teaching on Zoom, my voice pitch, I don't know whether Anne noticed this with herself, my voice pitch has had to change a lot when I teach on Zoom. So it's always coming from a different place in my voice. So I usually clear my throat a lot more than I would usually be doing when I'm teaching in a room with people. So if that happens, pardon me on that. So if we're on all fours, what I'm going to ask you to explore here is the region between the shoulder blades. So can we allow that area to be um, quite soft? Can we let it be quite relaxed? And can you let your shoulders <clears throat> move away from the ears so that when we're here and you exaggerate your in-breath just a little, can you notice, and I'm exaggerating it for the sake of the camera, the in-breath has a chance to lift the spine and the exhalation has a chance to drop the spine. So as I breathe in, the spine lifts. As I let the breath go, the spine drops. Now I'm making quite a large movement there, but you won't necessarily need to exaggerate it. Although I might take you there to start with and then we'll see how that goes. Just very briefly, if I grab a chair <clears throat> here, we can do the same thing by bringing the elbows onto the chair, keep the knees bent so the spine is quite long, and then we look at the same thing. In breath, exhale. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to ask you now to see whether you can explore this. This is where some people just watch and some people actually do it. Actually, if you're going to sit upright and stay watching, maybe you can explore this if you're upright as well. It doesn't work as well, but <clears throat> if you place one, if you're sitting upright, you can place one hand on your breastbone 
and the other hand is a strange position, you're going to need to try and get the back of your hand against your spine between your shoulder blades, but don't dislocate your shoulder on the way. And when you're here, when the breath comes in, can you get the breath to move between the breastbone and the upper spine? Those of you that are on all fours, you relax the shoulder girdle and then gently let the breath come in and bring your attention to the area between your shoulder blades. When the breath comes in, you're likely to notice that the spine between the shoulder blades lifts or rounds a little bit. And when you let the breath go, you're likely to notice that the spine between the shoulder blades drops and relaxes a little bit. Is this making sense? Yeah. Now, for a while, good, I just saw a thumb pop up in the middle of the screen, just only the thumb, that was great. That's a big thumb you have there. Um, so when the breath comes in, again, this subtle lift, exaggerate it again, just to feel for that movement, and then relax the breath, just like a sigh, and notice again what happens to that region of the spine. So you're becoming sensitive or attentive to that quality of motion. And then gradually, can you soften the breathing so it's a little more relaxed, but still maintain your awareness into the region between the shoulder blades? And can you still notice that there's some kind of rhythm going on there? Okay. Let's come away from there. Yeah, so I can see a few heads nodding. This, this region of your spine is ideally, if it's free enough, constantly on the move with the breath. So it's not something that's rigid, it's not something that's fixed. However, various postural patterns can create fixity or rigidity within that region. But gradually by bringing motion to the spine, we also start to bring maybe a different quality of freedom and space to the quality of breath. This is, um, you know, within the yoga world, I'm also involved in, in teaching yoga and I teach a lot of anatomy for yoga teachers. I'm, I was um, influenced by a woman called Vanda Scaravelli. Some of you might have heard of her. She, she wrote a book called Wakening the Spine and I luckily enough to meet Vanda and did a little bit of work with her at some point. Jenna, we're going to, if you can put a question in at the end, um, we'll, we'll sort of cover some questions at the end. I just saw the hand raised, um, but I, I'd like to sort of keep going. We're, go we're coming up to a break time um, at the moment, but um, I'm gonna carry on with some of this straight after the break. But this cat pose movement that we see in, in Pilates, in yoga, in some other practices, basically what the spine's doing on the in-breath is actually lifting, which sounds, almost the opposite to how some movement practices are teaching it. Because when some people go up into cat pose, they go up on the exhalation and take the abdomen back. But that's an active way to go about it. That's also a good way to go about it. Both processes work. So it's not that one is better than the other. What we're looking at is where the rhythmic quality naturally sits with the breath and the spine. And if you were to use the abdomen to take the abdomen up, to take the spine up, it's got more of an abdominal activity to it. So you're making it more active. This one is actually following a, following a natural rhythm of the spine and the breath. It exists all the time if the spine's free enough. Um, it's coming up to half past seven by UK time. So I said that we'll have a five minute break at that particular point. So Angelica, I see a thumb pop up there. Um, so. We'll do five minutes. We'll get back into the room five minutes time. You all know where the toilets are, don't you? So you can head off to those and um, see you in five minutes.
Okay, so we're back again. <clears throat> How's everyone doing so far? All okay, good. So I'm going to continue. So I'm going to go back to the slideshow and move on to just a lower region of the spine. This will come up, here we go. Ooh, not that one, this one. <clears throat> the image on the left, um, <clears throat> again, is showing us these various connections of the ribs to the spine. Of course, you can see the ribs have been cut short. Um, and we can see the presence of that ligament that exists along the front of the spine. Um, and it actually travels from the base of your skull right the way down to your coccyx. So the entire spine is one interconnected medium on, on so many levels, which again is something that we would, we would look at in detail. Um, but also what I'm interested in here, um, and the reason I, I bring this in is because it's something that we see, I would say 80% of the time when we're doing our dissections. And it's not that we're doing our dissections on just elderly people. Um, that, that has been that we've done dissections in, well, the oldest, or the youngest, sorry, has been maybe early 50s and then up from there. But something that we notice is an area called the iliolumbar ligament. And I'm going to point this out with my cursor. I'm tempting fate here because it might freeze my slideshow, but let's see what happens. So here we have the crest of the pelvis. So the iliac bones, either side of the sacrum, at the base of the spine. And we've got this crest of the pelvis. And you can see here is a lot of structure that exists between the iliac bone and then going towards the lower lumbar spine. And something that we notice commonly is that these ligaments actually start to harden almost like bone. So in some cases, we could say that they calcify. Some places we just find that they're densified. So densification is where it's just become thicker and thicker and thicker. But in, in other cases, it can calcify. So it gives an appearance just like bone. It isn't bone, it's, it's just really strong. But what has happened in that moment is there's lack of motion, or not in that moment, this, this has happened over a period of time, but what we start to see is lack of motion in the lower lumbar spine. Now, what I'm going to do um, is I've, I'm going to come off the chair and I'm going to come back to you because I'm going to grab one of the skeletons that exists behind me. Um, I've always got a gang of skeletons standing around me. Sorry about that. What I'm going to do is bring <clears throat> one of these over here. I'll show you this. <clears throat> and I'm going to bring you closer. So <clears throat> what we have here with our pelvic structure, you can see this left side of the pelvis. We're clear of any ligament structures. And what there is on this side of the pelvis are some ligamentous structures. Does that make sense to everyone? You can see that. So there's some kind of structure that exists here. And you can see what it's doing is that this material is going to the side of, can I get my finger around this vertebra? And also it's relating to the side of this vertebra. But the thing I'd like you to observe is look at how low these vertebras are into the body. This is L4 and L5, the fifth and fourth, the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebra. And they actually sit within the plane of your pelvis. So they're pelvic vertebra. Now you've got discs here. I always find this quite interesting. I don't know whether, <laughs> and you probably notice this as well with the plastic skeletons that you handle they always come with a red bulge on the side of the disc, almost as if it's mandatory that you should get one. That's not something that we should have. You're not born having to have that. This is something that happens where we see pathology, where there's lack of motion or compression. 
And what we commonly see is that there's lack of motion in these lower two lumbar vertebra, where maybe the lower lumbar ligament here, this iliolumbar ligament has become limited. Then all of a sudden, these two vertebra might as well be the sacrum, because then the sacrum, exactly Ruth, this whole area becomes fixed. And then what it does is it spreads the load to the structure further up. And then this becomes the joint that has to start all of the movement. Does this make sense? So it could well be that it's either compression, weight bearing down on it, or it could be that my head is drifting forwards and this area is dealing with the strain. Now there's all sorts of reasons that these things can start to build up. But when we look at the overall nature of a skeleton, it's just filled with joints, it's lots of space. So it's got a lot of potential for movement. Let me just move this out of the way, he says, almost dropped him on the floor. I actually did that with one of my skeletons years ago and uh, it fell, it fell on the floor, its face landed on the floor, and teeth went everywhere. That was quite an expensive uh, process to go through. So, um, <clears throat> Here are five of the lumbar vertebra. Okay, so these two, L, um, L4 and L5, of course there's no discs between these, but you've got these very really interesting um, layout of the joint structures at the back here. And these are determining movement in this particular plane. And what the lumbar region has available to it, just with every movement that we make, especially in walking, is something like this. Now, of course, that's quite exaggerated, but maybe not too much. But also where the um, lower lumbar vertebra sit inside those iliac bones, is when we walk, those iliac bones have a little bit of movement to them. So our pelvis doesn't act as a fixed unit when we walk. Otherwise, then we have a spinal column a rib cage and a pelvic bowl. And then I've got three structures that are fixed solid. Where the pelvis is connected to the sacrum is really strong ligamentous material. So there's minimal movement at the sacrum, but there's something. But that movement is projected out to the edges of the pelvis. So where you have this half of the pelvis, our sacrum would be fixed here. But the movement of the sacrum, if I move it a very small amount on my finger just here, look at how much these two points move just with the smallest movement at that point. So it project, projects the movement out to the edges. And what we would also see when there's a little bit of movement here in walking is that these lower lumbar vertebra have some rotation to them along with this movement. So what we really have, I'll see if I can do it, is more of an undulatory, exactly, undulatory quality to movement. And even though it starts off with a large two vertebra at the bottom with minimal movement, by the time that gets to the top, we've got a lot more range up here. So it transmits those forces through the system. Does this make sense? So what I'd like you to explore just for the moment, if you can do this, <clears throat> is to place one hand on your back. But you're going to look for these, now this is a, a technical term that Anne and I know really well, they're called sticky outy bits. Now, these spinous processes, the sticky outy bits at the back of the spine, and you're going to see whether you can get some of your fingers into the spaces. So you're going to need to dig around a little bit, feel it out, see whether you can find that. And then once you're there, sitting upright, can you carefully roll your tail under and take your tail out? But keep your head where it is. So if, I'm not gonna try this definitely, but imagine you've got a glass of water balanced on the crown of your head. I didn't bring this as a prop and this was just, I was gonna drink it, but I decided to put it on my head so that if I'm tucking the tail under or the tail out, you can't see me moving it, <clears throat> but this doesn't really want to go down and up too much. So keep the head where it is. 
And can you bring that movement to the lower part of the pelvis? And do you notice that your fingers are invited to open and close ever so slightly? So you're beginning to get a little bit of movement into those lower lumbers. And something I, I teach to my clients and, and students as well in movement practices is to get their fingers right down to the lowest part of the lumbers and see whether they can generate a little bit of localized movement just to bring rhythm back to those tissues. Something that we absolutely know of the, the dense connective tissues, stroke fascial tissues that exist across the lower part of the um, spine towards the pelvis is that once you start to get movement in them, they start to become pliable again. They become compliant to movement. But if I just maintain stasis, as I mentioned with the area through the, the spine and the arm, then what we start to see are thickenings in those tissues once again. Is this making sense to everybody? That's also a practice that can be explored for any of you that are movement practitioners, playing around with the um, cat pose idea. We can do that on all fours and just only by moving the pelvic end to once again, see whether we can generate motion there. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so Margaret, I saw a hand raised, but um, if you don't mind, if you can put the question in um, at the end, if, if there's a question there, then we can possibly have a look at that at the very end of the session. So here, I'm just gonna go back to the screen share. So <clears throat> when it comes to the spinal structure, what we see are a series of curves within the spine. So we've got three classical curves within the spine. Um, we, can, we can increase those curves in the spine, but the, our three classical ones are the cervical curve, the curve in the neck, the curve that runs through the area where the ribs are, the, the thoracic curve, and then the curve that exists in the lower part of the spine, the lumbar curve, which is the area that we've just been exploring with our fingertips on the back of it. Um, and those curves kind of exist within a series of um, notions really known as primary and secondary. So the primary curves are the curves that come from the pattern or the shape that we have in the womb embryologically. It's one big curve. So the skull is also considered to be a primary curve. When we see the shape of the, the fetus forming, there's a curve from tail right the way through to the, the brow ridge. So that's considered one big primary curve. That starts to divide itself up. The head is a primary curve. The primary curve also exists in your um, thoracic spine. And then we also see a primary curve through the sacrum. But for the moment, there's three of them that I'll look at, secondary, primary, secondary, the area in the neck, the area through the rib structure, the area in the lumbers. Your secondary curves develop outside of the womb. They develop as a response to gravity. So moving around, standing, starts to bring those curves into being. But there's an interesting correlation here between the spinal structure and the foot structure. So, <clears throat> Here's a foot. Well, in fact, it is a foot or is it a hand? Of course, obviously not human. If we've come from an evolutionary line, I, I say if, I have to be careful with this sometimes. I was teaching um, many years ago with Tom Myers in Milwaukee. So that's Midwest, America and we were talking evolutionary ideas, but of course, in certain parts of Midwest America, we were met with a group of, out of 150 massage practitioners, about 40% of them were creationists. So we had a bit of a problem in putting across the notions of um, evolutionary understandings of the body. So we didn't have that 40% come back after the lunch break. And I said to Tom, um, what do you think happened there? Or no, he said to me, what do you think happened there? And I said, well, you did come on very strong with evolution just then. So we have to kind of sometimes now say if we've come from that lineage. If we've come from some kind of lineage that 
would be on all fours. What's considered, and in fact, um, uh, Dr. Yap Vanderbilt has said this as well, is that, um, and also uh, Dr. Daniel Lieberman has said this, is that we don't come from quadrupeds, we come from quadra hands. We don't come from a four-legged structure, it's the structure that has hands at the base. And the strongest lineage for the human now has been known to be the orangutan. So that's where the DNA line is being researched at present. But they're not necessarily legs. They're limbs with hands on the end. And we've adapted ourselves to change the part that's on the floor or the ground, which we call foot. So where you can see this lovely hand holding the foot hand, we've done something different with the big toe. Oh, sorry, it's frozen once again. So obviously something about, maybe my computer became a, a creationist in that moment, I'm not sure. So I'll come back to you, hang on a second, and I'll go back to the screen share. Give me a second there. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is where I want to go to. So here we have two images from a possible evolutionary shift that's happened. And this is also looked at through um, archeologists as well. Is that where we see that opposing big toe, for us to walk and become efficient in walking and then running, the big toe lined itself up to, to be in front of the heel. So what that gives is a lot more propulsion for walking and running. Actually, it becomes essential really to survival for the big toe to be in that kind of position because it can give us a lot more push off. So we gradually see how this structure has evolved into the push off toe that we see in the, the image on the left. So that has a lot of propulsion. It passes forces efficiently through to the heel where what's happened for us to get upright is that we've dropped the heel to the floor, we've rearranged how the big toe is, but we've also done something very different with the structure of the heel bone and a bone called the talus. So in fact, what I'll do is I'll come off the chair and show you um, something here. Is that <clears throat> here we have a bone called the talus. And you can see a little black line on that that I've drawn there. It's because on, on the primate foot, the primate doesn't have this extra piece of bone on the talus. What we've done as an upright standing structure is to develop the bone downwards here. So what this does is it keeps the heel down to the floor. The primate doesn't have that little bit, it's curved at the back. So what the primate can do is to roll their heel up, which we see quite often. It also gives them a greater ability then to bring the heel round and use the foot like a hand as well. We've changed the structure. The big toe is more in line now, so it's not out to the side. And this lines up with the forces through to the back of the foot. So we don't really have the same structure that can do what the primate can do, but we cannot take it upwards. That, as you can see, when I do that, it can flatten the foot a lot. We, we don't have that ability anymore because of this extra change. And you can almost see it when I just show you the, the talus on its own. You can you see this interesting shape. It looks like another heel bone and then, or it looks like a foot and a heel bone, and then you've got the separate heel bone here as it drops down at the back. Does, does that make sense to everyone? So it's an interesting layout. And I don't know, Anne, whether you notice this sometimes with clients, and you'll notice this when you're walking around or you look at your shoes, is you usually see that the outside of the heel of the shoe wears down. Anyone notice that with shoes? That's normal. Now, one might wear down more than the other because our gait pattern sometimes is heavier in one than the other. But look at the back of the heel bone. This is the right foot from behind. No, nope, sorry. The left foot, can't tell my left from right. My left foot is the left foot from behind. Look at the angle here. 
So when that's standing on the ground, that's where it stands. When we walk, we roll through that. We roll through it. What we wouldn't want is that the heel of the shoe wears down on the inside. And in fact, there are, and I'm not going to get into shoe manufacturers, but I will say this, is that there is a particular brand of shoe that didn't have an inner arch support and it's quite loose around the foot. And what we would see is that the inner heel of the shoe wears down rather than the outer heel. And what does that tell us about the walking pattern? So what the foot does is it collapses inwards and then the shape of the shoe keeps driving the foot inwards, which means that we end up losing the support of the medial arch, the inner arch. Does that make sense to everyone? So that pattern on the outside of the shoe is usual. It's normal because your heel has that and it's built to roll. Yes, pronation, um, Jenna, absolutely. Yeah. So this is built to roll, it's what it needs to do. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the screen share. <clears throat> and no, I won't go back to the screen share. Let me just bring that off. This is obviously something happening with Zoom today. Never happened this much before. It's obviously, it's obviously a nervous um, presentation. So here, something I'd like to show you. So. <clears throat> The heel is a bone that sits quite far back from the ankle. And ideally for balance and support, can we have a lot more heel behind us? What we often see is that um, the heel gets pushed forwards into the foot. And in fact, it seems to be more of a Western trait than it is an Eastern trait. Some of that is probably because of the shoe holding the heel in when we're walking more barefoot. Well, I, I say this, but it's interesting speaking to a lot of students and clients nowadays, especially through the area of lockdown. So in the UK, we had what, about almost three months of lockdown. People haven't really been going out that much and they've been indoors without shoes on. And what they've noticed when they're putting their regular shoes back on, they feel quite tight on their feet. So there has been quite a change in the foot structure just over this particular period of time. It will, be, it will be really interesting for, I don't know who's going to do the research, but to see what the research would be on the foot dynamics through this particular era right now. Because again, a lot of people being much more um, barefoot. But also when an animal sits, and you can see that x-ray of the dog, is that they don't sit on their pelvis when they sit, they squat. Their heel is what they sit through. Now with the animal, of course, they don't stand with their heel on the ground, they sit with the heel on the ground. And if you're brave enough to put your hand underneath the bottom of a dog, you'll notice that the sitting bones aren't touching. The tail is touching if they have a long tail and the heel is down, but their pelvis doesn't touch down. And for the human, what we would look for is quite a lot more heel behind the ankle joint, because that's a place where it can stay stable. So if I go back to the head forwards position, when the head goes forwards, there's more of a tendency for the individual to try to come away from the heel. When the heel can settle, it enables the head more of an opportunity to get above the pelvis and to feel more secure once the heel is behind them. And what I find in lots of manual therapy is that if we're working with the neck and the shoulders in the head position, we constantly do the work on the foot so the foot can accept the change in the structure above. So <clears throat> here, I love these illustrations. Again, some of my favorite illustrations. And because I came from a graphics and art background, this illustration tells me so much more than just your basic picture that you would see in an anatomy book of a, of a foot. When we're trained in graphics and art, something that we also look for are the shadows. Look at the shadow that's formed, even though it's an illustration, 
it shows you that there isn't much of the foot touching the ground as a bony structure. Of course, if we add the tissue to that, the skin, the adipose tissue on the sole of the foot, and then the musculature, there's going to be different level of contact. But in terms of bony contact, there isn't a lot. The bones of your feet don't touch the ground. They, they sit in tissue. It wouldn't be useful for the bones of your feet to touch the ground. However, here there's an arch that you can see, and it's the arch that's running across from, from left to right or right to left called the transverse arch. And when we look at these two images, again, stunning images from um, Bernard Siegfried Albinus, and these illustrations are from the 1600s. I mean, they're quite stunning. <clears throat> so here, what we see, again, on the top image is something called the medial arch. In some English language, people call it the inner arch, but that's something that we would challenge um, as we start to go into looking at the foot structure on the course. But that's classically known as medial arch and not inner arch. And then on the outside of the foot, you can see another smaller arch, which you can feel on your own foot. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, um, and I'll come off the screen share, come back to you. I'm going to bring this down. I'm going to show you my foot now. <clears throat> so here we go. So right here. If you can find the outer edge of your foot from your little toe, can you come back to the back of the little toe? This here, this bump at the back. So here is one I prepared earlier. This bone here. That point that you're touching is the back of your fifth toe. And it's quite far back. It's about here. So that's the back end of the fifth toe. And the shape of it, <clears throat> if you can see, it's quite wide. So when the foot meets the ground, this area here of the fifth toe is something that rests out to the side slightly to generate what's known as lateral support for the foot. And then what we have here, by coming closer, is this tiny bone here. Classically, it's called cuboid, but it actually isn't a cube. It's got more of a triangular shape, but um, I guess in terms of how these were named in the days that they were named, it would have been more of a cube shape than the others. And we will look at that in detail at some point as we move into the course. But what it makes is a, a keystone of an arch. And this is the arch of the foot that is the least collapsible. This one in the medial side collapses a lot, but your fifth toe makes up part of the back of it. And it's a strong structure here. So what I'm going to ask you to explore here, just with your, <clears throat> your left foot only, if you're okay with getting hold of your feet. This is interesting when I've and I, and I don't know about you in terms of teaching, when you've got people looking at their own feet, some people don't like to touch their own feet. You'd be surprised. I mean, I come from a movement background teaching yoga and I teach a lot of Pilates teachers as well. And it's quite surprising how much people don't like to touch their own feet. So fine, if you don't want to touch your own feet, then, well, then we'll leave that. There are tricks around it though. Ask that person to use toe socks. You know, the socks that have got individual toes in them. If they buy those, it means they have to handle the sock and the foot differently. So they get used to touching their foot. And they also get used to the fabric of the sock being all the way around the toe when that's something that they don't normally experience. So in a way, by having them use toe socks, you're sort of um, you're being quite sneaky about it, I guess, but you're teaching them to handle their feet. But what I'd like you to explore, I'm sorry, I'm going to put my foot into your screen right now, is this lateral part of the foot here. Can you get your fingers around it? So what you're almost attempting to do is to get hold of that fifth toe side and open it. Now, don't do it this much, but looking to open it upwards, yeah, away from the rest of the foot. Go carefully. And your fingers need to hook back on themselves slightly so you can get right underneath that space 
and prise it away from the base of the big toe and go from the ball of your little toe right the way along this edge of the foot to the back of the little toe, quite firm, but not aggressive. If you've got long fingernails, of course, you can't hack, hack, um, hook the fingers back. You'll have to use the pads of the fingers. Does that make sense to everyone? Just on the left foot, so keep drawing it open, playing with it, opening out that space. Something that we see commonly, um, if people are wearing shoes a lot, is that that space gets compressed and the little toe gets pushed across to the other toes. So play with it just a little bit longer if you don't mind. Bear with me. But you didn't think you'd be sticking your fingers into your toes tonight, your foot tonight or today. Good. Now, when you've finished, come up and stand, please. <clears throat> and notice how that feels in standing. I can see Nancy, big smile on her face right there. <laughs> Oh my God, I've got different feet. Is that different? I know we can't speak because it's just it's too many people, unfortunately, but some of you noticing a bit of a change in how the foot settles. Now, if you give it a little bit more time, and this is, this is where fascial rhythm comes in, is that when, and the nervous system, because it's, it's not just about fascia. Fascia is great, it's a fascinating subject, but fascia really needs everything else in it. Now, a lot of other things. So yes, I can see from Livia, it creates more space, is that once you allow your foot to settle, when you've opened some space into it, that space, that new sensation creeps into the system. The nervous system starts to make sense of what you've just done and the fascial tissue as a continuity starts to adapt to those changes too. Living within that, you've got the musculature and so on, fluid flow, everything starts to adapt to it. Is this making sense to everyone? Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna come back to the screen share again. And we were about there. So we have our transverse arch, we have our medial arch and our lateral arch. That takes us, I'm gonna move on from that, back to the spine because your spine has three classical curves. The curve in the neck, the curve through the region of your ribs, the thoracic curve, and the curve in your lumbars. And if we go back here, you've got three curves, the transverse curve in the foot, the medial curve, and the lateral curve. So really, when we start to look at primary and secondary curves, these primary and secondary curves, we can extend through the entire body. The head shape is a primary curve. The neck shape is a secondary curve. The spine shape through the thorax, primary curve. Lumbar curve is secondary. Curve of your sacrum is primary. We stretch the analogy a little when we look at the leg, but when you look at someone's legs, in standing that are relatively well balanced, there's a gentle curve in the leg that's more secondary than primary. However, some people, and we would look at this at some point in the course, have more of a sway back knee, which changes their secondary curve more to primary. So that's something that might we would look at um, in terms of movement. But the heel bone is also primary curve. And then when we look at the arch of the foot, that's a secondary curve. The secondary curves are curves that develop as a response to gravity. And you started developing those secondary curves in your first year of life. Lifting the head develops your neck curve. Lifting your head also times that with your lumbar curve. And the moment you start crawling, if you were someone that crawled, you start to develop the curve in the arch of the foot. So those groups of curves respond to each other within that first year, and then that becomes the journey from there on in. So this is a, 
what could we call it? A neurofascial relationship, because it's not just the fascia, it's more of the nervous system responding to this, and it generates more of a timing and a rhythm within the system. And this is quite useful in terms of, you know, manual therapy, movement therapies, is, is knowing that those curves interact. Of course, some people don't crawl and there's other methodologies that we can start to explore to bring the curves back into the foot. And in terms of how these things balance, um, something that we've explored in labs here is that the foot size and shape is pretty much the same size and shape as the pelvic bone. So when we've looked at the iliac bone and we've looked at the foot, they almost weigh the same as well. The weight of the femur, the thigh bone, is the same weight as the two bones of the lower leg. So what we've got here is a counterbalance system. And we find this pattern repeated all over the body. And these, these findings just come up sometimes by accident. What if, an exploration. But again, it really helps us when we start to look at movement patterns, how we start to understand the layout of anatomy. Because once we've started to understand the layout of anatomy, it tells us very, something very different about its functionality. Here's Vanda Scaravelli, who wrote the book Awakening the Spine. That's her feet. She did something quite interesting with her feet there. In fact, we're going to explore something similar if, if it's okay with you. So I'm gonna come off the screen share and come back to you. <clears throat> so also let me just get rid of my presentation for a moment. <clears throat> so if you're okay with this, some of you might not be, but it will be on the recording for you to practice at leisure in your own time and see how this goes, is we're going to bring your right hand to the sole of your left foot. And can you get the fingers between the toes of your left foot? So your left foot's getting a lot of um, foot love today. So <clears throat> where you're getting the fingers between the toes, if I just show you on this plastic foot, <clears throat> look at the length of the toe bones. What you see of the toe bones when you look at your own foot is that you only see that much exposed. But the actual bones of the foot, the toe bones go deep to the center of the foot. So what you're exploring, of course, is getting your fingers between those toe bones. So here, fingertips or fingers between, and then gently, if you can, work the fingers right the way down to the base of the toes. Some of you, if you paint the toenails, you use those things you put between the toes, they're quite useful to use. Now I've heard all sorts of excuses with this. My toes are too short, my fingers are too fat. In fact, everything is built to fit. If we just give it a little bit of time, we don't force it, we don't make it aggressive. Sometimes using some hand cream on the fingers and on the foot, is really quite useful because it allows it to slip in. And then once you're there, just for the moment, let your hand stay where it is. So you allow the foot to ad adapt to the fingers between the toes. And then what I'm going to ask you to do here, it's difficult to just show you on the camera, is to squeeze the heel of your hand against the balls of your foot. So a little squeeze like this. So as you squeeze the heel of your hand against the, the balls of your toes, you'll feel, and you can see with my toes, there's this transverse shape here. You can kind of feel that transverse arch shape coming into form. Everyone got that? Now, can you squeeze your hand with your toes to the same degree. So there's a, a sensitivity of the hand squeezing the foot, but now can the foot squeeze the hand the same way? 
It's interesting. I had a student once where they jumped back because they didn't realize their foot could do that. And they felt that someone else was holding their hand. I call it a loving squeeze, um, but that makes it sound like a 1960s California band, the loving squeeze, but gently squeezing hands on the hand on the foot, foot on the hand, hand on the foot, foot on the hand. And then from there, if you can take hold of the heel, so basically you've got the fingers between the toes and with the other hand, you're cupping the heel. Once you're there, holding both like this, can you then, if I show you from the top, gently start to roll the foot around. And you can see, can you see the bones in the middle here, how they're responding? to the movement of both my hands. This is actually moving quite well as a plastic foot. This plastic foot has wire through it. So to all intents and purposes, this would be less mobile than a human foot. And yet I see a lot of human feet don't move as well as this. What you have is a lot more um, elastic tissue. It's much more pliable. So again, when we're here, can we roll? Maybe take the hands in opposite directions to each other, not aggressively, gently, one way and then the other way, and then rolling the foot with a little bit more range. Just a little longer with that. My nose in this position right now, but I'm sitting on the floor and I've got my screen down there. Okay, let's relax from that. <clears throat> let's let the foot settle. Maybe have both feet next to each other. And how does that feel from one foot to the other? You're not even standing on them. So, <laughs> Angelica, feeling like an ape. Yeah. <clears throat> now, let's come and stand once again, if you don't mind. <clears throat> and notice how that foot feels. Walk around. How does it feel to walk? Possible differences coming up further up the limb. Now, because we're coming up to quarter past eight in the UK time, which is our time for um, sort of just wrapping up and then looking at some of the questions and then also passing to Esther. What I'm going to trust you to do is a little bit of homework is to do the same with your other foot. Now you might want to do that as we're wrapping up, um, but also just, you know, the moment we finish give the other foot some foot love as well. Don't worry, you won't be imbalanced forever. These things retract quite quickly because we're not doing treatment, but you start to see how quickly these changes can occur in the system and the effect that has through the nervous system. There's an incredible amount of neurology in the feet and there's some interesting understandings now of the structures that wrap across the front of the ankle here that um, are, are so highly involved in balance and posture, much more so than we ever um, realized. And this has come from a lot of the recent fascia research that's been going on. Um, and a lot of the fascia research, the, the neu neurology of fascia has become really exciting as a field to study. And it makes so much sense as to what we're doing also as manual therapists and the qualities of touch that we have. So on that note, I'm going to sort of pass back to our team and, and Esther. And Esther, I think, has been looking at some of the questions. I know a few hands got raised um, as I was going through that. Sorry to sort of keep you putting that in the question box. But um, thank you for being present to this. Thank you, Gary. Um, so thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. Um, if we don't get time to cover them all now, please just feel free to drop me an email if you have any further questions. Um, so Gary or Anne, um, maybe you could give some indication of 
who the uh, course is for, um, what kind of level it is. Some people are interested as to whether it might be um, too simplistic for them, maybe um, depending on what their background is. So if you could discuss that a little bit, that would be great. And did you want to start that? Yeah, I mean, I've had all levels of um, people with different levels of knowledge on the course from people that struggled with English, people that hadn't sat on a school bench or tried to learn something for 20, 30 years, people that hated school, <laughs> uh, all the way through to somebody who just left with, was it like a master's in human biology or something like that. Um, I don't think I've ever had anybody be really, really annoyed that they had to do the course and they knew more than we did. Everybody at some point learned something. And the people that thought they would struggle managed to learn what they could learn. And that's what I see it as. We, we teach to many different levels and you can always yourself, if you wanna know more, dive into it more. <clears throat> and I, every time I teach it, I learn a bit more. I don't expect all of you to grab everything we say and remember it and store it in your brain and know it just by heart afterwards. You'll get a level of it this time. Next time you come through something similar, you'll grab another level of understanding and put another level on. So I see it as a layer cake. You know, we are learning lifelong and you'll get whatever you are capable of grasping right now. So I, from my point of view, I would say everybody at all levels will get something out of it. And it's mostly been people that were therapists, wanting to be therapists, was thinking about becoming a therapist, but we've had accountants and musicians and actors and dancers and from all walks of life on the course. And they have, because they were interested in, in it and they were willing to learn and sometimes just not expect anything, but just take what came towards them. Just be open. Um, everybody got something out of it. And that's my joy of teaching is to see people in the seminar one, two, three struggling, and then see them again towards the end where you can just literally see the light bulbs flash and all the connections start to make sense. And you can start to pull something back that you learned early on and it connects with the new stuff today. And you create some kind of whole picture of the human body. Yes. And me, I mean, 30 years later, I'm still learning. They are still discovering new things. It will never end. So it's not, you need to learn this. Is we are gonna introduce you to things and you can take whatever you can at the moment and start to make the connections, but you'll be learning for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Exactly, I think when you get to see something from a different perspective, um, <clears throat> it changes your vision forever. Yeah. Um, some, sometimes you wish you never saw it that way because it does literally change a lot of things. However, um, you know, we, we have a benchmark for anatomy, which is the basic model. And then we have other models of anatomy that are beginning to grow into different ways of seeing. And we start to realize that all of these maps and models of anatomy, we can keep working with and bring out different elements of those maps when we're working with our clients or um, lecturing or working and teaching classes and so on. Um, you know, I, I, these, these sort of courses I've always seen, especially in my experience of, of teaching the rare anatomy courses that I have run, is that it's, it's a blend of manual and movement therapists from every possible background, you know, exactly as, as Anne has said. And also, you know, I've had paramedics in, on some of my sessions mm -hmm. where looking at understanding this work from a different perspective. And it's just made sense of, a few things that might have been confusing to them. 
So, so there's always something that, that we take away. And again, you know, once you see something differently, the whole vision of the body changes. And it, it takes a while for that to sink in because it's not what we thought it was. So you, as Anne said, you're, you're ne you never stop learning from that moment on. You know, we think we understood the body, but everything that's going on right now with this, these, un these this understanding these new maps of the fascial body has changed the vision completely and it's led the research to go deeper. And we're, we're living at such a wonderful time where that research is coming up every single month. So certain things that I say is be prepared to be frustrated sometimes, <laughs> um, but also be prepared to drop in at quite a deeper level. But then also we go deep and we go global. We look at it simply and we look at it deeply because um, all of those aspects of it need to be understood. And I'd say it's not only for craniosacral therapists. It will be mentioned a lot just simply from the background that we have and because it is such subtle work. But I often speak as a physiotherapist as well and the things and the conditions that I see. Um, so as long as you're interested in the body, it'll be a course that, that's valuable, I would say. Absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so another popular question is how is the course related to craniosacral therapy? How does it feed back into that? And um, yeah, because all the structures that you hold when you learn craniosacral therapy is what we teach. The fascia, the flow, the organs, the energy. Um, and because I, I'm very good at 3D visualizing as well. You can't put your hands on the heart and the liver, but if you have a good understanding of where it sits, how it moves, how big it is, you can put your hands on it and imagine that it's in between your hands. And that imagination starts to enable you to connect to anything between your hands or on top of your hands in a different way than if you just know where the skin is and where the bone is. Yes, and I also think that understanding texture of tissue um, is really important so that we, you know, we might hear or read about various layers that exist that are produced in anatomy books, but really every, every layer of tissue that you see is actually a texture. Mm. So you can start to discern texture. You've got a lot more information at your fingertips without trying to figure out the names of these layers because you know, eventually you're going to not really no, need to know at some point those names, but you're going to understand texture. It's just that you'll go, go through these names and look at them, but eventually your textural understanding will completely change. And how one tissue structure is moving relative to the other is something that by knowing what's there, you can start to pick up the feeling of it. Great. Um, and so in terms of the course being online, um, some people are asking whether there's going to be uh, handouts and other uh, material that they can engage with that's not just um, looking at a screen. Yes, um, I've actually pulled out last year's um, paper. So there is a student handbook that will be sent to you when you signed up and before you start. And in that is about an overview over the course, how we teach the teaching approach, study time, pre-reading, timings, the teaching team, where well, you've met us now, um, assessment, home study, um, other work that might we're still working on that one have to be done in the summertime an assessment at the end how you submit your work you email it to the person that taught the course um, how many sessions how many weekends you have to attend and what to do if you can't attend one then you can do some other work it's all explained in here useful books, uh, embryology books, biology books, dates. And then at the end, there's an overview 
of the whole course of what it's called and who is teaching it and the dates for it. So you'll get an overview of all the weekends and who is teaching. The other one is a more substantial uh, compilation of course notes. So for each course, each weekend, has its own three, four pages in here with an overview of what is being taught, all the key words, um, all the bones, the processes, the names, the ligaments, the embryology, some pictures to help you get started to begin with. Uh, until you get your own books, there's pictures of some of the vertebra. And then towards the end of each of those chapters, there is the homework that is to be done for next week. Um, and it is usually mentioned, is it five? Let me just see the last one. We usually ask you to, let me just go to the last one of uh, seminar seven. Let me just see the homework there. Just as an example, um, right, so the homework for the seminar that I teach about the gut is three key points on what the digestive system, what the digestive system does to your food, food. So three key points is short sentences, three key points of the functions of the small intestine, one key point, why do we eat? And then three key points on why is the liver so important to health? So that's the homework. You type this up, you send it to me, I correct it or mark it or say wonderful, amazing, well done and send it back to you. Um, and that's the homework for each seminar. And that gets sent to the teacher that taught it the week before the next seminar, which means you then have a week to read up and be ready for the next seminar, which I highly recommend. Because there's nothing worse than sitting, listening to something you don't understand, you can't remember, you don't know what it looks like, we are good at explaining and we are good at giving you images, but you do have to at least have read the chapters, not necessarily understood or remembered everything, but you have to have seen what is it we're trying to teach in this seminar and how does it sit within the wider picture of the whole body. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we are at 8.30 now, but maybe we could just end on um, just a little idea of what to expect on the foundation day. So the foundation day will be going into a, a deeper dive, maybe into one, one, one or two areas, but um, just to give some interest in that. Now we'll kind of give a, a stronger overview as to what we've been doing with the course, because today we've had really with, with our teaching time, probably about an hour and a quarter really of, of some information there. Um, but the whole purpose is to just teach you to get your thinking in a slightly different place. So seeing things from a different perspective, um, we'll do, be doing a few movement exercises, looking at lectures, um, exploring some of the models, just as I did today, but we'll just pack it out so it's a little bit longer. Um, so that's really what you're going to be expecting. And maybe a bit more discussion as well. So it depends on the numbers that are in there, but we'll be um, attempting to get people into groups as well. But I think the discussion side, once we can get that going on, there's a lot more that happens once we can start to get into discussion. So certain questions that can come up around that rather than it just being a question on text. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so it's 8.31 now. So we should probably wrap up, um, but thank you everyone for coming. I'll let Gary and, and Anne just uh, say their final farewells. <laughs> um, 
there's any more of the questions that are coming through, I mean, the, you'll probably need to pass those questions through to Esther. Esther can look at those, but she will um, send those questions on to Anne and I to look at as well, so that you can get a lot of your questions covered in terms of the technicalities of the course too. Um, we have the, let me just have a look on here. I'm just going to show you on a slide at the very end here. Where are we? If I can get to it. It won't be this one, it's the one next to it, but more images are in front. So we are here. The foundation day is May the 29th. Um, and then the nine weekend part of the course starts um, from the 17th of July, and it will be weekends from there on in. Um, and, and that's and that's that. So I'll stop the share. But thank you everyone for coming along, Anne. Yeah, thank you very much for hanging in here for two hours. Um, I hope to see you on the course. And um, yeah, any questions, uh, send them to Esther, please. And then we can see most of them are sort of self-explanatory. Um, yeah, it was lovely to meet so many of you. I hope to see you later. Have a good evening. And you take care of you are in the world. Yeah. Stay safe.